Welcome to this video about planetary migration. Now, we're going to look at the migration of a planet in a disk around a star. This is typically during the formation process of planets and while stars are still quite young. Now, there's a few different types of migration that can occur in this scenario. We're going to look at type two for this particular video. Now, if you didn't see any of the other videos, then this is just a, a recap of planets and stars which you can skip if you want to. So planets do not always stay on the same orbit. They can wander about, so they can move inwards, they can move out, they can even get thrown out of the system altogether. Now, there's a few different processes here or ways that a planet can move. They can move in a disk, they can move not out of it, or outside of a disk, so when the disk has been dissipated once the star has finally formed and moved onto the main sequence. But for this video, we're just looking at the movement in the disk itself. So where it all starts, stars form from the collapse of large gas clouds. So you have these large gas clouds that collapse under their own gravitational forces. They heat up in the center. And once that gets to a temperature sufficient for hydrogen fusion, then you have a star. And that's the basic idea of how stars form. Whilst that's occurring, you get a disk of gas and dust around the star. And it's there that the planets get chance to grow. So the planets form in these disks whilst the star is still a, still young. It's not quite a star, it's more of a protostar, and it hasn't quite undergone hydrogen fusion in its core yet. So this is where you're going to get these planets forming. And there's some images here of disks around young stars. Some of them may already have planets. Some of them may just be forming planets, but we can't actually see them. But we can see some of the interactions that they're doing, causing gaps. So during the formation process, these planets can move around in this disk. So in this gas disk, the planets can move inwards and outwards. There's a few different types and that will dictate how it moves and how it migrates. It also explains why some planets are quite close to their stars or they're located in very weird configurations. One of the prime examples is hot Jupiters. So hot Jupiters are these massive planets like Jupiter size and above that are located very close to their star. Now they actually can't form there. There's not enough mass in the disk. There's not enough material there to grow a planet. So they must have formed further out where there was more material and they've migrated inwards. The one scenario as to how they get where they are is migration in this disk, which we're going to have a look at. So they typically wouldn't form where we see them now. So three main types of migration in one of these disks. Type one concerns small planets. When I say small, we're looking at like terrestrial planets, Earth size, Mars, that sort of size planet. And then you have type two. Now, once they get to a certain size, they're big enough and they create a gap in that disk. So that's type two. And then type three is the same as type one, so same size planets, but these disks have vortices in, it's turbulent, and they are interacting with those vortices. And that basically gives a slightly different method or way that they actually migrate in the disk. So they migrate different to all the others, but they're interacting with these vortices. So when they're about the size of Saturn, they will transition from type one to type two. So these are now massive enough that they can cause a significant change in the structure of the disk. So they actually clear out a gap and it typically occurs around about the size of Saturn. Now that depends on the disk that it's in and a few other parameters, but it's generally around about that sort of size. Now, once it gets to this size, it gravitationally clears out this gap. So it has enough mass and enough gravitational force on the disk to clear out its orbit, basically, of any material, or it, it causes a significant reduction in the gas and dust in its local orbital area. Now, the simplest view of this particular process is that there's no gas transfer across the gap. So gas in the outer part of the disk can't just move over to the inner part of the disk over the gap. It's a fairly simple view and it's not quite as simple as that in reality. 
because the planets can still grow, but it helps understand as how a planet is going to migrate in the disk by assuming that is the case. So the gap width is determined by the temperature and viscosity of the gas in this disk, but also the planet mass. So a bigger planet creates a wider gap, smaller planet, smaller gap. And this is quite important actually, because a lot of the time we can't directly see a planet in a disk, but we can see a gap and we can measure the gap width. So if we can measure that gap width, we can infer the size of a planet that would be there. So we could indirectly detect a planet by looking at the distortion it causes on the disk. Now, that's interesting because when we go to Saturn's rings, moons do a very similar thing. So in Saturn's rings, there are a number of moons that are located inside the ring itself. So they're embedded in the ring, and these actually cause a gap in the same way that a Saturn-sized planet might cause a gap in a disk. So they have enough mass that they can gravitationally clear out material in its orbit. And it's pro the, the gap width is proportional to the moon mass. So a bigger moon causes a bigger gap, smaller moon, smaller gap. So even if we can't see a moon there, we could work out its approximate mass. And that is true for planets in these disks as well. We typically can't see the planet because they're so far away. But the gap width is a really good indicator to how big a planet might be. Now, how does it actually migrate in the disk now that we know that it creates a gap and a few other things? Well, the planet is going to migrate with the viscous evolution of the disk. So what does that mean? Well, it's a disk of gas and it viscously spreads. So it spreads outwards and it spreads inwards. The inner part of the disk spreads towards the star and is then accreted, so, or it falls onto the star and the star continues to grow in size. So if your planet is located on the inner part of the disk, then actually it just follows the evolution of the disk. The disk is moving inwards, so the planet moves with the disk inwards. Remember, there's no transfer of gas over that gap, so it does whatever the disk is doing. Now, if it's in the outer part of the disk, the outer part of the disk is actually um, spreading outwards and the planet will then move outwards. So in type two, you can actually get inward and outward migration, whereas type one, it's mostly an inward migration. So type two, it depends where it's located in that disk to where it's going to move inwards or outwards. And it just relates to the evolution of the disk itself. Now, some images of disks we found that could have planets in. So this is an example of a disk around a star, and it has a fairly significant gap all the way around. Now, we can't actually resolve a planet because it's too far away. The planets are too small. But if we can measure the width of that gap, we could work out approximately what sort of size planet might be causing it. And this could be evidence for a giant exoplanet in this particular disk. And some more. So these are some more disks around stars that could indicate that there's planets there. Now again, we can't directly see the planets, but we can see that there are gaps there. There are rings which are going to be gravitationally shaped by unseen planets. So we could investigate this and work out approximately what sort of size planets are causing this, how many planets would be required to do this. Now it's worth noting that actually these gaps, rings, are not always caused by planets. It's a good indicator that there might be a planet there, but there are other processes that don't require a planet that can cause a similar effect in these gas disks, which is worth noting. But again, it's the it's one of the best explanations we have for these hot Jupiters, as we mentioned earlier on. The only way they can really get there is if they've migrated inwards from further out. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we think this is a... You know, one of the processes for changing the orbit of these large planets. So thank you for watching and if you enjoy then check out some of the other videos.